Greetings, netizens of YouTube. The ongoing controversies connected to institutionalised paedophilia in British society has always held my attention. My personal background and connection with British institutions has meant I have a particular interest in these cases, what they say about society and whether shocking crimes of this magnitude continue today. So, some years ago, when I first heard the allegations against a man whose TV programme I watched as a small child, I was agog. On the 25th of February, a review set up by the BBC chaired by Dame Janet Smith was published. It was tasked with investigating the culture of the BBC with reference to the sexual abuse of children at the BBC by Jimmy Savile and Stuart Hall. Savile is considered to be one of the most prolific paedophiles in UK modern history. It is estimated that he sexually assaulted or raped hundreds of children throughout his career. However, Savile died in 2011, and it was only a year later that his crimes were exposed in a documentary on BBC's network rival ITV. Much of that information in that documentary had been gathered by the BBC's Newsnight team that intended to broadcast a report on Savile within weeks of his death. The report was blocked by BBC management. Stuart Hall was the presenter of the BBC's family entertainment show It's a Knockout from 1972 to 1988 that drew audiences of up to 15 million. Hall admitted abusing at least 13 girls between 9 and 17 years of age and was jailed. But the 1,000 page report only tells part of the story. Without understanding who exactly Jimmy Savile was and what lessons can be learned about the cult of celebrity, it's entirely possible that the powerful and the famous will continue to use their fame and power to abuse children. Jimmy Savile begun his career first as a DJ, then going on to manage dance halls in Manchester back in the 1950s. He began his media career at Radio Luxembourg in 1958 and then received a call from the BBC to present their first Top of the Pops on UK television in 1964, which he continued to present for two decades. He also had regular shows on Radio 1, but it wasn't until 1975 that he became one of the most famous celebrities in the country, presenting Jim Will Fix It, which ran for 20 years. Savile was an untypical employee of the BBC, clearly working class, he was one of the earliest nationally known BBC figures who didn't come from a privileged background. Jim Will Fix It, which held a prime time slot on a Saturday evening on BBC One just before Doctor Who, was a national institution along with its presenter. And the format was ideal. Children from around the country would write into his programme asking good old Jimmy if he could arrange for them to meet well-known celebrities or sit in the cockpit of a Concorde aeroplane during takeoff. Though anybody looking at him now would think he was an obvious creep at best, he seemed to have a natural way with people. I will leave a link to one of his shows in the description bar. If, like me, you are genuinely interested in the mindset of parents who would ever leave their children alone with him, and the charm his programme possessed, please watch. And it was a nationwide programme, with children from all parts of the country taking part, rather than just selected middle-class children from London and the southeast of England, as would often be the case on the BBC. Back then, working-class people probably preferred watching ITV, the only alternative TV broadcaster at the time. Once the wish of the child had been fulfilled, he or she would travel to BBC Television Centre in West London with their parents or relatives to be presented with a well-known Jim Fixed It For Me badge in the studio by Jimmy Savile. The Smith Report is a thousand pages long and interviewed more than 700 people. Rather than rely on the interpretation of those in the media, I spent the past couple of days soaking it in. The report found numerous complaints had been made about Savile, but none of those complaints were reported to senior management. The BBC failed to protect young children due to inadequate measures in place amidst a permissive macho culture that played down inappropriate contact with children. Over a hundred witnesses reported hearing rumours about Savile. Some members of BBC staff were aware of Savile's conduct. Perhaps the most important point with reference to today was the BBC's attitude towards what they call talent or major stars such as Savile who appeared untouchable. It was established that dozens of children had reported Savile's sexual misconduct to BBC staff. 
The media has been quick to label the report as a whitewash, but perhaps this is an exaggeration. Part of the criticism stems from whether the BBC was aware of Savile's activities and at what level. The report states that the BBC can't be considered to have known what was going on unless a staff member as senior as a department head had knowledge. This means that even if executive producers and editors of news programmes were aware of what Savile was doing, the BBC as a corporation can't be said to have known what was going on. Savile's Radio 1 producer, Ted Beston, had knowledge of his activities and didn't report them to a higher up. Canon Semper, Savile's producer of a programme called Speakeasy, was also aware of Savile's inappropriate contact with underage girls. Semper went on to become head of religious programmes, which was not considered the head of a department, according to the report. Semper himself believed that BBC managers knew about Savile and thus didn't report anything. But the report does touch upon the central truth of the matter in my view. Most of those that knew what was going on didn't report because they were afraid of the consequences. And if a head of department heard about what was going on, and I'm sure they did, were they really going to raise this topic in a board meeting or contact a BBC governor? A really difficult choice. A head of department who can be replaced relatively easily against talent, who makes more money and good publicity for the company than most employees put together. Dame Janet addresses this. Celebrities were treated with kid gloves and were virtually untouchable. One witness told me that the talent were more valuable to the BBC than their own values. The only tangible result of the report thus far has been the sacking of Tony Blackburn, a well-known radio DJ who has been at the BBC for decades. It's been implied that Blackburn may have been involved with an underage girl in the 1970s who later killed herself, although he denies this, and that he didn't cooperate with the report investigators. Whatever the truth, the media have seized upon Blackburn's sacking as an example of the report being nothing more than a whitewash with the solitary DJ being the only scapegoat. Of course, it's worth noting that the BBC's media rivals have a commercial interest in discrediting their competitor. The BBC will respond to the report over the coming months and is expected to implement new directives and safeguards to ensure that this type of thing could never happen again. But it begs belief that people were unable to join the dots. Quite aside from his eccentric looks and whispers about his appetite for young women and easy access to children, Savile appears to have been single all his life. It seems plausible that many parents related to Savile due to his background, or were also spellbound by his celebrity. This was a man, after all, who was friends with prime ministers, royalty, globally known celebrities and religious figures. Why wouldn't they trust a man who spent Christmas at Prime Minister Thatcher's official country residence, Chequers, on more than one occasion? At the time, their friendship seemed genuine, although Thatcher surely must have understood that Savile fulfilled a role in fostering a sense of society and in providing children and their parents a small dose of Sommer necessary to lead less rebellious lives. It's important not to underestimate how huge Jimmy Savile was in British culture. At the height of his popularity, there were only three TV channels, and the BBC had tremendous influence, and he was effectively the flag carrier of the corporation. In the 1970s and 1980s, television, before alternative media and the internet, had a mesmerising power upon everybody. I had the fortune to visit BBC Television Centre in the 1980s as a child, and was completely awed by the scale of the building and beside myself with excitement just walking past the doors on the curved corridors which bore the names of the shows I watched. No doubt it was the same for his victims and to a degree their parents. When I first heard the allegations against him I had trouble digesting them because of who he was. To me it felt as if part of my childhood was being ripped apart. Worse than this, from a personal perspective, was the much-beloved Rolf Harris, an Australian entertainer who had his own show called Rolf Harris Cartoon Time on the BBC from 1979 to 1989. 
Although he could hardly be described as a serial offender like Saville, Harris seemed like such a cuddly and genuine man and was widely respected. Hell, years later, when we kids were grown up, the guy appeared with his harmonica at my student union, and how we loved seeing our childhood figure come to life again. He was found to have abused four girls and was jailed for six years. Further charges are pending. But Harris, Saville, Hall are just a few of the many public figures that were guilty or suspected of abusing children. Allegations of paedophile rings in Westminster, consisting of decision makers, including senior politicians and businessmen, persist. It would be a serious mistake to presume that these types of activities are confined to people in the public eye. The most recent large-scale child abuse occurred in Rotherham, where over a thousand young girls were raped, tortured or were victims of sex trafficking, which continued unabated from 1997 to 2013. Institutions like the police and the local authorities are both negligent and cover up heinous crimes, even today. And a look at the statistics show grim reading, to the point where sexual abuse seems like a growing epidemic. However, as the NSPCC report points out, it is likely that this increase in offences over the past year is due in part to the yew tree effect, i.e. a greater willingness to report abuse due to the recent series of high-profile sexual abuse cases in England and Wales. So, a proportion of these cases listed in the statistics are historic cases of people abused in previous decades, but did not want to come forward. There are no official figures released related to historic cases, so it's difficult to say whether the sexual abuse of children is becoming more common or not. It's thought that historic cases account for many hundreds of reported cases per year. These are the children that were abused in public institutions such as schools or children's homes. And the school I went to was no exception. There were at least three paedophile teachers employed at my school whilst I was there. One of them was actually arrested by police in front of school pupils the year after I left, despite the protestations of my former headmaster, who pleaded with the abused boy's father not to destroy the abuser's career. Perhaps I will return to this topic of my school and the cover-up of child abuse in another video, but I will say that the conduct of our former headmaster enrages me. A sanctimonious man who would drape himself in high morality, quote from Charles Dickens and expect the highest possible standards from his pupils. But he in fact was a disgrace to the teaching profession and allowed the widespread abuse of children while he looked the other way. Institutionalised abuse of that kind, I hope, is a thing of the past. A question I sometimes think about is whether prolific offenders exist in large numbers to this day in institutions, that in a number of years will we hear more allegations. Children are still being abused, but has the culture of secrecy ended? Has the open discussion and huge media awareness of this topic helped? If some reports are to be believed, it is the teachers or those in positions of authority that have to be careful in certain workplaces, as potential accusers are given the benefit of the doubt and allegations can cause serious difficulties for the person accused. Nevertheless, with Rotherham in mind, maybe it's not institutional child abuse that should be the focus now. Although the alleged ringleaders were brought to justice recently, these types of cases must be a priority. But what is it that enables paedophiles to act with impunity inside and outside of British institutions? And are these sexual abuse issues that seem to be a feature of British public life a sign that there is something wrong with British society? Or perhaps the truth is that many countries have not even come close to investigating the dark history of their past and present. I also can't help wondering about those that knew or suspected that abuse of children was occurring and didn't act. Could they have at least sent anonymous letters to their bosses and national organisations that were set up to protect children? Might they have informed police directly or gone to the newspapers more readily?
or even anonymously informed parents what happened so they could take matters into their own hands, even if that only meant their being able to take a hammer to Saville's caravan, which was conveniently located inside BBC Television Centre car park. Perhaps my father suspected, and wisely ripped up that letter I wrote to Jim will fix it.